and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Now is a particularly hotly contested time in American politics, with midterms and a potential party flip for Congress right around the corner. As such, I'm incredibly honored to be joined by one of the best known commentators and participants in the American political economy of the past four decades, Larry Kudlow. Director Kudlow has had a long and storied career with success working on Wall Street as a media commentator and in politics. He entered politics in 1981 when he joined the Ronald Reagan administration and most recently served as the director of the National Economic Council under President Trump. As such, he's been not only a key thinker, but also driver of American economic policy. He now hosts The Larry Kudlow Show. In this interview, we do a little of everything. Larry reflects on his experiences working across the Trump versus the Reagan administrations, the similarities between Reagan and JFK, the upcoming midterm elections, and on his time studying here at Princeton University. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter at Madison Program and find out more about us and what we do at jmp.princeton.edu. And with no further ado, I hope you enjoy. Larry, welcome to the show. Great pleasure to be here. So there are very few people um, who have both the experience studying uh, what's happened in the economy and what's happened over various presidencies and also the practical experience of having worked in some of these presidencies as you have. And so I'm wondering, I want to start sort of right at the beginning. You used to be a Democrat and you supported JFK, who you have a really fantastic book about before becoming kind of a lifelong Republican and serving in the Reagan administration. And so I'm wondering, what was it about John F. Kennedy that led you to him? Uh, And was it your views that changed or did the Democratic Party change or did both change to sort of lead you on the path that you wound up going down? Well, it's a little of both. I mean, the book I wrote about JFK and Reagan, that was, I wrote that in 2016. So that was way later. Yeah. Um, But in terms of uh, being a Democrat, you know, I was an anti-Vietnam Democrat, basically, Hmm. uh, when I was in college and uh, grad school. So over a period of time, let's see, I went back. I went to the University of Rochester, then I went to the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, which mm-hmm. I guess doesn't exist anymore, but whatever it's called now, <laughs> I went to uh, went to work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Anyway, my views gradually evolved during the economic uh, crises of the early and mid 70s, actually throughout the 70s, into more of a free market economist. As a young Democrat, it was really mostly about the Vietnam War. I mean, to this day, mm-hmm. I'm still against the Vietnam War, for whatever that's worth. Uh, <laughs> not our veterans, Lord knows, and not our military, but that particular war. So it just kind of evolved into more of a free market. And I had worked in some Democratic campaigns briefly, but um, the last Democrat I really helped out was uh, Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Mm-hmm. New York, who was really a kind of a Republican. I mean, he worked for Nixon. He worked for Ford. He actually worked for JFK. He also worked for LBJ. And Pat and I were very good friends for decades, actually, when I came to Washington for Reagan. But, you know, I became a supply sider, free market capitalist, learned most of my politics from Ronald Reagan. I liked what he did. I liked him. I liked his style. I liked his civility. I liked his sense of humor, which was often self-deprecating. I love that stuff. And I always try to abide by it. You know, recently I, at the William F. Buckley Prize Dinner, I worked with or I worked for Bill Buckley at National Review. But Bill Buckley was a longtime friend with the same idea. We could have our discussions and our debates with a good deal of civility and humor and self-deprecating humor. You know, there's only one Bill Buckley, there's only one Ronald Reagan. I'm not that, but you know, those are sort of my role models. Democratic Party has become hopeless. It's veered so far to the left. 
uh, in the last 20 years, the last 10 years, and particularly the last two years. It's virtually a kind of European style labor socialist party. And they're about to get uh, a big shellacking. <laughs> yeah, and I w definitely want to ask you about that because it's such a salient issue right now. But I guess to sort of stick to contextualize with the more historical stuff just for the moment, uh, you are one of the few people who has served under both President Reagan and Trump. Um, and President Reagan is such a giant in the movement, and he's a president who kind of every faction over time, it feels, has wanted to claim as their own. So I'm kind of wondering, from your experience, having actually served in both administrations, what was what was your experience about where Reagan kind of stands within the movement? And are Reaganomics the same as Trumponomics? What, what were the differences? Yeah, I mean, on economic policy, mm -hmm. the two are very similar. And I would add to that JFK. I mean, yeah. JFK was the first supply sider mm. um, after World War II. And his legacy is very important in that respect because when Kennedy cut marginal tax rates across the board uh, and maintained the dollar as a strong currency in those days, literally as good as gold, uh, those were policies that that I learned uh, worked through historical experience. Those were policies that Reagan believed in, and those were policies that Trump believed in. I mean, look, yeah, I worked in the Trump campaign before I went into the White House, and what did Trump do? He had the largest corporate tax cut uh, in history. Hmm. And, um, he was also uh, a major league D regulator, cut red tape, cut expenses, you know, open up all the industries, particularly oil and gas permitting. Uh, so those were things that Reagan absolutely agreed with and practiced. And those were dear to my heart. Mm. And I might add, they worked very well. Trump yep. is obviously a different person than Reagan temperamentally. I get that and personally, but in terms of economic policy, Absolutely. And also, even on trade, mm. uh, people regard Trump as a hopeless protectionist, but he wasn't. Mm. I mean, the fact is, what Trump wanted was reciprocal trade deals. Yeah. That's what Reagan wanted. Reagan went through the same issues with Japan that Trump went through with China many years later. Uh, but we had, it's funny, I had Mike Pence was on the show last night talking about this. You know, we concluded the largest uh, trade deal in history, the USMCA, uh, and that's something Reagan would have been proud of because mm. both sides had to give and take and there was reciprocity. So at all those economic areas, I think the similarities between Trump and Reagan are, are very stark. And by the way, um, maybe not so much on foreign policy, although, you know, Trump was a, a believed in, in looking out for America first and mm. so did Reagan. Reagan was a fierce anti-communist. JFK was a fierce anti-communist. So nothing's identical, and the contexts are somewhat different historically. Yeah. At least in economic terms, uh, JFK, Reagan, and Trump were economic growth guys. They were supply-side tax cutters. They were free market capitalists. They were deregulators. Mm. And I'm happy, and I think it's very interesting that you bring up um, trade with China because that's an issue that's been quite controversial and and also I think kind of in some ways a pivot for the Republican Party. Um, and my my one of my chats that I recently had with another economist who I know you're friends with, Tyler Goodspeed, he ended our interview on a really thought provoking note about how bad economic conditions can lead to war. Um, and so when we talk about this trade war with China, um, as a lot of people are calling it. Um, talk to me a little bit about how the Trump administration addressed that. And, you know, especially coming from someone who is so generally in favor of free trade, what was the result of the tariffs that were put on China and where do they currently stand? You know, look, I think Tyler is right. Uh, he's a dear friend. Bad economic conditions can lead to very difficult foreign relations, mm -hmm. no question. But 
you know, we spent two years, I was on the China trade team. We spent two years negotiating the deal. Mm -hmm. And China is very difficult. China is an adversary. Yeah. Uh, they're not some friendly competitor. And it was Donald Trump that rang the bell on China. And that was one of his greatest achievements. Mm. You know, he pulled back, he pulled back the curtain and said, you know, these are not people who are our friends. Mm. And, uh, However, having said that, we had relations with China. Mm -hmm. And regarding trade, Trump used tariffs to drive a hard bargain. And as someone who participated in that, uh, over time, I came to agree with him. Mm -hmm. That there were moments when China was being completely intransigent. Uh, there were moments when, for example, President Xi, president for life, as we call them, now he is president for life, I guess, uh, was at loggerheads with his own negotiators, uh, Liu Ha, for example. And um, that made it even harder. We didn't know who we were really talking to. So there were moments when President Trump got impatient and used tariffs uh, as a negotiating tool. And I'll tell you the truth, you know, looking back on that, I think he was right. I mean, look, we got a deal, phase one. I don't know, even to this day, how to assign a success rate to that deal. Okay, mm. I don't know. I mean, I've talked to Robert Lighthizer quite a bit about this. He was our lead negotiator, mm. a very brilliant trade guy. Um, but we made steps or we took steps, or we agreed to steps, that's the way to put it, that would lower uh, some tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, with respect to the purchase and sale of commodities. We also took steps to reduce the intellectual property theft. Uh, steps were taken to open up the Chinese economy mm. uh, where not every industry had to have a 51% Chinese ownership, particularly financial services, not, not other, uh, elsewhere. I don't know if uh, the, the intellectual property theft and the forced transfer of technology were two enormous issues, very tough mm -hmm. nuts to crack. And, and I don't know, Annika. I mean, I, I honestly am not sure where we are. Some progress was made but it's very difficult to quantify it. And as you know, in the last couple of years, because of China's uh, aggressiveness in foreign policy and their human rights violations and their running roughshod over Hong Kong, uh, the adversarial relationship has become more adversarial. Mm. All I can say is those agreements are still on the books. Um, the trade balance hasn't changed all that much. I think the financial services progress is still around, but I think that a lot of American companies no longer want to do business with China Yeah, for a variety yeah. of reasons. And also China has cracked down on its economy. Uh, the free market reforms that go back to Deng Xiaoping in the eighties, uh, following the Nixon Kissinger openings, um, those reforms in the last 10 years and the last uh, four or five years and the last couple of years have gone backwards. There's been tremendous regression. Uh, what she is doing is reinstituting state control over the economy. So that will probably mm. make trade even more difficult. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up because she has been making the news recently for pushing out economic reformers, as I know you know. There All used my to be. Are gone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, over a period of time, I mean, they're not, they're not like my, yeah. you know, my best friends from prep school or something, but, <laughs> you know, you, you have a series of dinners and meetings over a two year period. We went to Beijing a couple of times, they came to Washington a couple of mm -hmm. times, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I would just say to you, the good guys, yeah. are, they're gone. And that's a very bad sign. 
do you think, I mean, when you, especially when you compare that state of affairs now to the view that there used to be that if we let China become more capitalistic, it would democratize. I mean, that, I mean, it hasn't happened so far and it seems that she is, you know, pushing out kind of all these reformers. And, and as you say, that's going to be really bad news for us trade-wise. Um, how is that going to affect that thesis? Well, look, that was the Milton Friedman view. Yeah. Free trade leads to democratization and political reform. Look, I think at some level, Milton Friedman, who was an idol of mine and also Mm -hmm. uh, when he was alive, was a friend and mentor. I mean, I think Milton had a point, but it has it has been pulled out. China has gone the wrong way on democratization. Yeah. Just as they've gone the, the wrong way on economic reforms. And the guy who taught me this, I mean, I remember when I uh, was appointed to the White House uh, NEC, National Economic Council, um, I called on my friend Henry Kissinger, Hmm. uh, who lives about an hour north of me in Connecticut, and I spent five and a half hours with him one Saturday and went going through it. And we were in very close touch with Henry, who is a brilliant man, particularly on China. Hmm. And he, he agreed. They're going the wrong way, and it's going to make it much, much more difficult. In fact, Kissinger agreed yeah. with Trump's approach that sometimes you had to hammer them in order yeah. to get any movement. It's not the idyllic free trade, classical free trade, certainly of the 19th century or mm. even the 20th century in the post-World War II period. The game has changed, mm. and I, I will defend Trump in, in one very important respect reciprocity Hmm. like we will you know we'll lower our barriers but you have to lower yours too definitely and that was not done with various china deals Hmm. down through the years particularly uh during the george w bush and obama administrations and it it worked to the detriment of our uh, workers, our workforce was harmed, our blue collars were harmed, our construction people were harmed, living standards went down because we were giving stuff away for free and getting nothing for it. So Trump rang the bell on that. But if you talk to Trump, I wrote a couple of op-ed pieces about this in my, while I was in the White House. And I spoke to the president at some length, obviously. His view always was if you could have uh, pure free trade significant reduction in tariffs, significant reduction in non-tariff barriers and subsidies. He's all for it, but it had to be reciprocal. Hmm. And you, you have even some conservative opinion nowadays that wants a kind of idyllic free trade, we'll cut our tariffs and all will be well. That's not the way the world works and we learned that the hard way. Really interesting. Uh, to draw the conversation, I guess, back to domestic policy, which given the upcoming midterms is such an important and salient thing to discuss. Biden ran, it occurred to me, and you can feel free to push back on this analysis. He ran kind of styling himself as like a Bill Clinton following a Ronald Reagan, someone who is very moderate, and he didn't govern like it. Um, and so why do you think that Joe Biden was trying to run as this kind of very moderate Democrat, but became such a progressive? Why is it that now the American people, do you think that they didn't get what they were voting for? Well, look, at, uh, you know, I don't know if those suppositions are actually right. Mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, the guy spent most of the time in the basement of his home. Right. You know, it wasn't much of a campaign. When he surfaced, uh, like during some primaries, debates in the primaries you know he did say he was going to end fossil fuels right i mean he said that and he talked about raising taxes on the rich he, he attacked the trump tax cuts he attacked the trump deregulation he taxed supply siders uh, he's doing it to this day it's just that we didn't pay i won't say we i did but many people didn't hmm. pay much attention to it right okay. right as he was billed as the non-Trump candidate who was mm. going to somehow be a unifier, mm. all right? Um, so I never bought into that. I know some people did. In any case, your, your second point is stronger that politically there was that view. Mm. And turns out Biden is a harsh 
harsh, partisan, far left progressive Democrat and all of his policies. You know, that's why we call it big government socialism uh, mm -hmm. for raising tax. You know, he's an income leveler. He's a big government spender. Uh, he believe he sees things through a, a racism prism. Mm -hmm. uh, he left the borders open. We closed them. He opened them up. Uh, he sides with the teachers union because they're the backbone of the Democratic Party. So it's far left Bernie Sanders, AOC. Uh, that's that's what he's become. Now, mm -hmm. I will tell you this. I've known Joe Biden 30 years. OK, mm -hmm. uh, in my old TV show on a different network, I used to have him on all the time. He's always running for president. I always have. <laughs> him on. And we'd have wonderful interviews with great sense of humor. And I would see him in the green room in Washington or something. And I, I would say to you, I like him. I've always mm -hmm. liked him. I don't like this Joe Biden, but I like mm -hmm. that Joe Biden. Um, he's an empty vessel. Mm -hmm. he is, you know, it's like wherever the Democrats are going, that's where Joe Biden went. And um, right now, the Democrats have gone far left, progressive socialists. So that's where Joe Biden's gone. I don't know what he believes in. I don't, I don't know if he has any beliefs. <laughs> He's a, he used to be a bread and butter unionist, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, socially moderate. He actually voted, by the way, for the Reagan tax cuts in 1986, mm. believe it or not. Mm. And he used to have a stronger law and order position. And uh, But then again, he was the guy who went after Clarence Thomas in the hearings. Let's mm. not forget that. So I guess, you know, we're heading into midterms now and economics, which is your field, are really, as you've observed on your show and other places, really top of docket. I mean, in some ways, shockingly so, given how much it feels like so many parts of the American fabric are falling apart. But economics are really top of docket. And I think most people would say, unless you're Joe Biden's personal spokesperson, that our economy is not in an optimal position right now. And it seems like there's kind of three factors that contribute to that maybe more, but three main ones. There's the shock of COVID. There's the fact that we overreacted. We spent a whole bunch of money. And there's the role of the Federal Reserve um, and that they didn't raise interest rates fast enough. And so when you look at those three causes, I think maybe the most charitable case would be to say, okay, COVID messed up the situation. There was no good way out. When you look at these three factors, how would you kind of rank them in terms of what has caused our current economic situation? You know, we, we rebounded from COVID. Yeah. COVID was, you know, a terrible, terrible natural disaster kind of event. Mm -hmm. I mean, terrible, you know, million lives lost and so forth. But it had no lasting effect on the economy. The economy had a strong grounding. This was after the Trump tax cuts, after the deregulation. And in, in fact, I say this all the time, you know, Joe Biden, uh, who will not speak the truth about the economy, everything he says is fraudulent. He says, I inherited a recession. He did not. The economy was growing uh, six and a half percent when he took office and the inflation rate was barely above one. Mm. Now, those are facts. All right. My critics will say, I'm just doing political stuff. No, I'm not. Go look at, just look at the first book. I mean, we were in fine shape. The labor market was recovering. Unemployment fell way, way, way back down. Inflation was muted. The stock market was booming and Biden launches into a high federal spending inflationary policy, which honest Democrats like Larry Summers and Jason Furman argued against and paid the price. We've all paid the price. We're still paying the price. The other biggest mistake he made was uh, to declare war against fossil fuels. This whole fossil fuel war has done us enormous damage. Mm. We should be producing 14 or 15 million barrels a day. We're still below 12 million. Uh, permitting, leasing, pipelining. People are suffering everywhere. It's had enormously bad impact on the economy and the inflation rate. Uh, and of course, all of his re-regulation uh, of businesses, he's against, he's anti-business. He's basically running the socialist line. Those are the problems. COVID, you know, difficult. I, again, I don't want to downplay the human losses and tragedy of COVID, 
but in economic terms, it's passed. Hmm. And, and I don't want to get into what Tony Fauci did or did not do. That's <laughs> way too hard, at least for this discussion. Yeah. But I'm just saying, no, basic mistakes, over overspending, overregulation, uh, the war against fossil fuels, raising taxes on businesses and entrepreneurs. This is what's strangling our economy hmm. in a year, really a year, but 15 months. He took a non-inflationary boom and turned it into a record high inflationary bust. And that's not an easy thing to do in one lousy year. I mean, I've been around a long time. That's not an easy thing to do, but he did. It. And so these policies are going to be repealed because voters do not want this progressive vision. They do not want to transform America into some kind of woke society. They don't want it. And you'll see the revolt in the, uh, you know, in the elections. Well, um, with the last couple minutes, I have one last sort of fun question for you. You spent um, you spent some time here at Princeton um, in your storied career, and and I'm wondering if you have a favorite memory or, or favorite lesson learned from your time here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I enjoyed. I was there for a couple of years. Um, um, I met a lot of really good people, graduates mm -hmm. and undergraduates. I, I, uh, I was dating a woman in cap and gown. I enjoyed that. I went to their party. <laughs> uh, one, one of the things was uh, both years, uh, both summers, I was there. I was commuting to a job in New York City. Mm. And, uh, you know, Princeton has a fabulous tennis set up. I, I was a, a varsity tennis player in college. Mm. I still play, but I used to play doubles with the, the former great Princeton basketball coach, Pete Carrill, uh, who just passed away, unfortunately. He was a legend and an icon on campus. Uh, Pete had great basketball. I mean, Princeton's always had great basketball. Anyway, we, he found me, and I don't remember what he called me. He didn't call me by my name name, but he called me something. And I always played with him because I could move and he couldn't. And when he played, he, Pete Carrill was famous for smoking cigars. He smoked a cigar while he was playing doubles <laughs> tennis courts. Uh, if you, I don't know where they are now. It used to be by the old Jadwood gym. That stuff's probably all changed. But I, I, I will always remember that. And I also, look, uh, there's a lot of very smart people there. At least they were in those days. They used to invite me back uh, during the P-Raids and have a seminar, you know, in yeah. the Woody Woo Auditorium. But I have not heard from them in about 15 oh. years. <laughs> so I think, they, I think they've written me off. Oh, Larry. I used to have debates with the faculty you know, guy, and it was a lot of fun, but those days are gone. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Larry. Really, really great to have All you right. on the show, and I so appreciate it. Good luck to you, Nika. Take care. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Larry Kudlow on Reagan, Trump, JFK, Princeton, and the upcoming midterms. That's all for today, and we'll see you next time here on Madison's Notes.